Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Simon, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Yeah, thank you so much, Robbie. Yeah, so I'm I'm Simon. I'm a I'm a medical doctor based here in the UK. Um, and apart from my sort of clinical job, one of my main roles is as the head of research at Sapphire Medical Clinics, which is the first medical cannabis clinic that set up in the UK back in 2019. Now, what exactly are you researching at this clinic? A large part of my research um, revolves around what we call either observational data or real world evidence, whatever you want to call it. So looking at some patient registry data from the UK Medical Cannabis Registry and really seeing what are the effects that we see in people that medical cannabis is prescribed for, both in terms of changes in condition specific um, outcomes such as pain, anxiety, general health based quality of life, but also importantly, evaluating the safety um, of that prescribing. So seeing what types of adverse events people have um, who are prescribed medical cannabis. Now, did you have any thoughts on cannabis before? Obviously, you got the job or you started researching into this area. Did you know anything about it? I mean, have you tried it before? Uh, I've never I've never tried cannabis before. Um, I think in the UK, what happened wasn't how I became involved in medical cannabis research really was around um, at the point of of rescheduling in the UK in November 2018. We went from a point of um, prohibition, um, essentially, to a point whereby um, access to medical cannabis became legal and research became much easier to conduct overnight. And so my first sort of foray was was a lot of my background in research had been around um, surgery, pain, cancer, inflammation. That was kind of the the initial um, root of my interest into medical cannabis. And, and that still does play um, a significant part of my, my research interests as well. Um, but what became very evident is that although the legislation changed in the UK, um, actually um, the prescribing of medical cannabis was going to take like this, um, a really different route to how we see the prescribing of most other medical products in the UK. And so um, what myself and colleagues at Sapphire Medical Clinics really wanted to do was make sure that we're capturing evidence for those people who are being prescribed medical cannabis, just so we can see, you know, what is exactly happening to these patients? Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? What is the safety of that medication? Um, and so that was really kind of how uh, I got started in, in medical cannabis research. Um, so it has really only sort of been since 2019, but, but really before that in the UK, it was really difficult um, to do research around, around medical cannabis. Do you think there was a stigma on it before and then now that you're kind of involved in looking at some of the research aspects that, especially with legalization, I mean, 2018 before my state legalized it. Now it seems like everyone I know has like a medical cannabis card, which I'm like, I don't, I'm pretty sure you don't have anything wrong with you. You're just going around saying you got, you need medical cannabis. But I'm wondering, do you think that the stigma has kind of changed? Like it's less kind of, you know, taboo to talk about marijuana a little bit or cannabis, especially if you're using it. Cause I do think it has benefits. I think the, the stigma around it is definitely changing. And I think that comes down to a few points. I can mainly only really speak about the UK rather than the US, but, um, you know, as awareness has grown around the use of medicinal cannabis in a medicinal setting, um, you know, that only serves to reduce the stigma that people uh, face. And I think that a lot of the perceptions come from you know, maybe sort of glamorization in American movies and things like that, where people are sort of circumventing the system to get a medical cannabis card. Whereas in the UK, we actually have like a really robust system. So you can only be prescribed medical cannabis if you have a diagnosis of a condition and you pre can previously demonstrate that you've tried and failed to gain sufficient benefit from licensed therapies. So for instance, if you are someone with, ang with anxiety, you would have to demonstrate that you've tried, you know, a, a minimum of, of two either antidepressants or another anti-anxiety medication before you can even be considered for medical cannabis. So I think that, that also that kind of um, regulation in the UK also helps to make sure that people really see it as a, as a legitimate uh, medical product um, rather than something that, you know, people are trying to gain access for for recreational reasons. I would say in the U.S. it's probably a little bit different because it seems like the ease of access to get cannabis or your medical license is you just go into the doctor. You start complaining about 
depression or something like that, you don't if you don't want to take the drugs for those symptoms or those things, you can just get your medical card and then that alleviates it too, which get, creates this myth of medical cannabis, which makes it seem like there's no downside. It's only positives. So, I mean, have you, can you maybe expose some of like the, what the accurate information is on medical cannabis? Like what symptoms has it been known to treat and do better for? And then also if you come across anything that you've kind of debunked when it comes to medical cannabis, like I said, nobody ever brings up the the downside to it, which I'm sure we'll get about later in this discussion. But I think it's important to have both sides of the conversation involved because it seems like some people are just walking in thinking that's 100% cure all my pain away drug. Yeah, no, definitely. I think um, there's sort of some distinctions to make around medical cannabis. First of all, you have um, like licensed products. So those are products that have gone through in the UK, it's the MHRA. In the States, it's the FDA. In um, in Europe, it's the European um, equivalent. And those products are called Epidiolex, um, Sativex, and Navalone. And um, those have been licensed medical cannabis products for specific conditions. So Epidiolex is licensed for the treatment of treatment-resistant epilepsy syndromes in young children. And that's a CBD isolate formation. Sativex contains an almost one-to-one ratio of CBD to THC, and that's licensed for the treatment of um, spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis, so where their muscles are really um, stiff and, 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 and it's been licensed to treat that. And finally, Navalone, which is a sort of synthetic THC product, um, which has been licensed for the treatment of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. So those are the, the kind of conditions and products specific for those conditions where we have sort of the highest level of evidence um, whereby you know the regulatory authorities in a number of jurisdictions around the world have deemed them to be you know um, to an acceptable safety and efficacious standard whereby they can be made um, available as a pharmaceutical product. So sort of the next tier down really um, and that's what a lot of my research focuses on is unlicensed um, cannabis-based medicinal products or CBMPs or medical cannabis as most people refer to it. And this is probably what, what most people are probably more familiar with when you talk about medical cannabis and it can encompass a number of forms. It could be in dried flour, oils, tinctures, um, suppositories, etc. Um, and these are products whereby they haven't gone through that process, but that doesn't mean that there, um, there is no evidence to suggest that they may have a benefit or or harms. They just that means that there's not sufficient evidence that's been generated yet in order to be able to kind of go through that same same process. Um, and for those conditions, we certainly see that the most amount of prescribing is related to chronic pain. In the UK, about sixty percent of people who have prescribed those products have a chronic pain condition. Uh, the next sort of largest group of conditions are anxiety disorders, which make up around 15% of prescribing. Um, and then other psychiatric conditions such as PTSD and depression, uh, autism and ADHD, as we, we kind of touched upon at the beginning, uh, also make up a significant portion. And then you also have a number of neurological conditions that, that it may also be prescribed for, such as um, uh, epilepsy, Parkinson's, um, etc um and so so for those conditions i would say kind of the conditions where it's most commonly prescribed i.e chronic pain is where we have the most amount of of evidence around um how it works and you know if it is beneficial or not and what we can see from the evidence is that um firstly if we take them as a whole um, there is some evidence to suggest that it may be beneficial for certain people who haven't benefited from first-line products. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's a panacea and it works for, for everybody. When it comes to psychiatric conditions, it, it, the evidence is more vague, that it isn't as clear-cut as when it comes to um, chronic pain. But what we what we can see is some signals towards benefit and largely in the UK where it's prescribed is again for those people who have failed to gain benefit from first line products. Um, and you know it's it's worth considering for those people who are otherwise eligible and don't have any contraindications for it being prescribed. 
Um, and then you sort of touched around safety. I think what everyone always wants to talk around is psychosis and the risk of that. Um, with cannabis, there is a risk of, of drug-induced psychosis. Um, that's very clear from when you look at, um, at like psychosis populations in mental health hospitals and and sort of in the community. But I think it's it's important to draw distinctions. With the US, it's slightly different. So um, obviously, you in most states, you get given a medical marijuana or medical cannabis card by a physician, and then you go off and you source your cannabis via a bud tender or some other process. Whereas in the UK, and then there's sort of less strict follow up in terms of how you see those patients. In the UK, um, what happens is, is you have a prescription written by a doctor for a specific product with a specific THC, CBD, and other active compounds components. And then you have regular follow up at a minimum every three months. And so what we see actually from our populations in the UK is that there is relatively low incidence of psychosis, even within the populations of people with depression, PTSD, other psychiatric illnesses, whereby you would otherwise assume that they would be at high risk of developing psychosis anyway. So um, that's a really long-winded answer to your, your initial question. Um, but you know there there is um, a wealth of evidence out there in terms of both the the benefits and the drawbacks to medical cannabis. But what we always need is just more evidence in order to be able to drive forward um, the field further. I want to ask more about the psychiatric conditions and why the evidence on that is uh, vague, um, which you mentioned. But when it comes to the UK, is that it, like what's the THC and the CBD content or ratio? that is being given when like how much like for certain conditions like if you had a certain condition it was an overall percentage of cbd mixed with a little bit of thc compared to something that might have more thc in it and cbd does that mess with like i you mentioned you mentioned about uh prescribing these drugs in the uk and then having low psychiatric like barely little psychiatric kind of reactions or psychosis from it could that be a higher ratio of cbd because i've been recommended cbd more than i've been recommended things with a higher thc content because of the psychosis factor that comes with it yeah so that was a lot of short syllables in a short amount of time <laughs> yeah, so they're, so they're definitely there there is thc in medical cannabis products in the uk but by by no means do they have to contain THC. Um, they can just be CBD isolates. They can just be THC isolates as well. But um, at Sapphire Clinics, um, we understand that a lot of the evidence is around sort of a balance of the two, um, rather than um, in particular with regards to there being a high THC content versus versus low. And there definitely is there's some evidence around high CBD versus to a low THC ratio. Um, in terms of, and realistically, in terms of the um, medications that provide that, there are some dried flowers available for vaporization that do have a balanced ratio, but largely um, the sort of high CBD content tends to come more from oils rather than from dried flour. Um, and what we see in comparison to sort of synthetic cannabinoids or um sort of illicit cannabinoids here or, or recreational elsewhere is that the the thc content really doesn't um for the most part doesn't really go above 20 percent and sort of the um for a very few number of products sort of the maximum is 25 percent thc content we don't see sort of 30 percent and, and above um certainly within the uk medical cannabis um field so so again that's something that that to bear in mind when you're looking at a lot of the observational data around uh, recreational use, it tends to be sort of uh, higher THC contents compared to those that we're seeing in, in medical cannabis in the UK, certainly. But when it comes to the psychiatric disorders, the evidence from that being vague, you mentioned that earlier. What what do you? Why is it vague? I think it's it's a general challenge with medical cannabis research generally. If you were to take any other medication for a psychiatric condition, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just pick one at random, like um, citalopram, for instance, like a very common 
very frequently prescribed antidepressant for anxiety here in the UK. You just have one formulation available at a few different doses, only available in like a tablet form, and it's just one active ingredient within that tablet, right? It's just it's just Zipanopram. Whereas if you want to do some research around medical cannabis, you first either have to make the decision, are you going to look at it in the form of an oil, a capsule, a flower, a vape cartridge, a suppository, and all of those I mean, will have different um, profiles as to how your body metabolizes it and um, from all that point of view. You then also have to decide how much CBD and THC is going to be included within that, that formulation. And, you know, again, you can have a really wide variety within that. And indeed, sort of the other minor cannabinoids and sort of other minor active pharmaceutical ingredients, um, you know, there's conflicting evidence as to whether they have a true effect in the clinical population, but we definitely know that they do affect the way that your body metabolizes CBD and THC. So again, your, your choice around those really can um, make a large difference. And so when, once you take all of that into account, you could, you could have hundreds of thousands of different choices as to what you want to study within your population for, for whatever it may be. And the challenge there lies in if you are a company that wants to invest in randomized controlled trials, which is what is ultimately needed to get to that kind of licensed product status, you are going to have to take a hell of a risk to decide that you're going to put all of your eggs into one basket and invest millions of dollars, pounds, euros, whatever it may be, into that one product that may or may not be successful in, in those trials. Um, and then, you know, even once, you know, there definitely are a few of those, the challenge comes in that nobody is, is saying, okay, we're all going to choose this one product and invest all our money here. They, they look at lots of different products. So you might have something that's really high CBD, something that's really high THC, something that's balanced, et cetera. And then, so if you're looking at the data on Citalopram, you could pull together all of the different trials that have ever been done on Citalopram, and it's all the same. Whereas what lots of people try and do when they look at the medical cannabis literature as a whole is they try and bring it all together and say, medical cannabis is all the same, no matter what it is. And therefore, whatever outcome we get from that applies across the board whereas we know that that you know is unlikely to be the case something that is high in cbd is unlikely to affect something someone in the same way that something is high in thc um and so that those are the sort of real challenges that um that we face in terms of doing doing research in in this area particularly sort of those randomized controlled trials which drive things forward and give us the best and highest quality evidence um and so, yeah, you know, it's it's a it's a huge challenge to overcome for, and whoever can kind of unlock that um, is going to do really well. Um, whether that be a government who invests in it for, you know, as a nation or a company, whatever it may be, it, it it's going to be really important in terms of driving the field forward. Um, because at the moment, I think, you know, a large um, number of of countries are kind of at at a crossroads whereby. Um, they're sort of changing legislation, but they're not really doing either the investment or the sort of infrastructure in order to be able to create those like, you know, those licensed products. So you're kind of in a in a position where in the UK, for instance, there's been a change in, in legislation, but there is there's a real difficulty for most people in being able to access medical cannabis. And so um, people are kind of, you know, stuck, even though the law has changed actually access for many people um still looks the same um than before before it had changed now do you with the products the different types of products that they use does the absorption factor come into play when it comes to the which way they absorb it whether you talk about suppositories or whether it's an edible or whether it's something like that i would feel like that would not maybe mess with some of the data that you're going to be pulling out of it but it some people can have a different reaction depending on like I have a different reaction towards an edible than I do if I smoked marijuana or something of that sort. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I think so. Um, so I think it's important to note. So in the UK, smoking of medical cannabis is still illegal. So even if it's prescribed, if you, Man, if you smoke, whoops. it's actually still <laughs> no. That, that sounds like fun, but I just still, if anyone from the UK is listening, I just want to make that really clear. It's still illegal. 
Um, and it's definitely advised against. So um, just like with tobacco, igniting um, anything and then smoking it carries, you know, um, the risk of producing carcinogens that cause cancer and also releasing carbon monoxide and affecting sort of the respiratory system that way as well. Um, whereas with vaporization, it doesn't burn the cannabis, it um, heats it up to release the CBD, THC, whatever else you're prescribing from within it in a vapor, and therefore the risk of producing those is much is much less. So, so that's just um, a quick thing. But um, it does entirely, um, whichever routes of administration you do is going to entirely affect what the main outcome may be. Um, and it's kind of according to the desired effect for your symptoms. So a good example that I always give people is for people who have insomnia. And the main problem with their insomnia is sleep initiation. So they find it really difficult to get off to sleep. For that, you want something that can um, have a really quick onset of action, but then um, tails off very quickly so that in the morning you have no sort of remnants um you know hangover effect from whatever you may be prescribed and so for that a uh, vaporized flower may be the most appropriate for for someone in that kind of circumstance because um that has the quickest onset and the quickest tail off whereas if you have someone who's in chronic pain throughout the day um an oil which um you, know, you hold under your tongue and doesn't reach that peak as quickly, but also stays in your system for longer, may be a more appropriate thing to be prescribed. But maybe if you have bouts of acute pain throughout the day, um, you know, a flower uh, in combination with an oil may be useful so that if you have an acute pain episode, you may, may be able to take your flower product um, in order for any breakthrough pain. So, so yeah, you're, you're exactly right to the, you know, the, what the formulation is, um, is massive in terms of how it's prescribed, how it is used by patients, what it may be prescribed for. Now, I want to kind of drift into ADHD and your study on ADHD and uh, cannabis, but have have you seen evidence that is beneficial? Have you seen more of the adverse effects? I mean, is that only with, um, I'm sure with a disorder like that, I mean, there's so many factors that probably go into play, but something as serious as like bipolar disorder and other ones that affect more mentally than, I mean, anxiety is, I would still consider a serious disorder. It's just, it seems like everyone's got it now. It's not like a rare thing that like either you're genetically born with or something of that sort, where I would say schizophrenia, I would consider that top priority of like, this is something serious that all, everything should be focused into. But I'm with those types of disorders, they have more of the, I wouldn't say most impact into a person's life, but also it's, I would consider, like I said, more serious to focus on than some types of anxiety stuff. I'm not shaming anxiety. I'm just saying, but with those disorders, I feel like that would be a main focus for research and ADHD is starting to get up there a little bit as well too, with just how much of the, not side effects, but how much it actually messes with a person's life a little bit, where I'm curious if there's been any evidence to support that cannabis actually does do any good usage for ADHD and also how you even decided to look into ADHD. Yeah, so um, so I think maybe starting from the back forward, like how we decided to look into it. So um, the way in which um, like the major compounds in medical cannabis, CBD and THC predominantly work is through something we call the endocannabinoid system, which is, you know, um, a series of receptors and transmitters within the within the body that really mimic what we find in the plant, particularly CBD and, and THC. So um, that is the way in which we sort of notice the, the predominant effects of, of cannabis on the human body. And this uh, endogenous system is expressed predominantly as you may anticipate in the brain and in the spinal cord, but can also be found in the immune system, in the gut, um, and that's why you see like such a diverse range of conditions whereby people uh, report medical cannabis, you know, um, has either benefited them or may be beneficial or or whatever it may be. Um, but with respect to ADHD, um, looking at preclinical models, so sort of before human studies, um, it is really the effects on the on the dopamine system um, that have really. That sort of really prompted the um 
the interest in its use for ADHD. And we know that the medications that um, obviously are commonly used in ADHD, particularly stimulant medications, have a profound effect on the dopamine system within the brain. And so um, medical cannabis, well, cannabis in general, but medical cannabis um, has been um, suggested to induce anxiolytic effects, so reduce anxiety levels in, um, in preclinical models of ADHD, and also reduce restlessness and impulsive behaviors by increasing dopamine levels within the brain regions that are sort of implicated typically with ADHD when we look at humans. So that would, that's kind of um, the sort of underlying reason why myself and other people wanted to look into cannabis and ADHD. That's kind of the, the brain circuitry and what and why people may want to look at it. I think also another key reason why people may want to look at it is um, current medications for ADHD, if you look at the evidence, are incredibly effective if you just take medications as a whole. But just like all medications, they don't work for everybody. And um, more so with ADHD medications and particularly stimulants, we know that there's a high rate of non-compliance. So people don't take their medications because of some of the associated side effects um, and also some of the intense monitoring that people have to go through if they're on stimulant medications. So um, so again, another reason why people want to look at it is, is, you know, we're always on the lookout for new novel things that may be useful for any condition and ADHD is, is no different from, from that regard. So that's kind of the, the reasons why people are, are interested in it. In terms of the evidence of its effects in ADHD, um, so on those core symptoms of ADHD on impulsiveness, on, on on the impulsiveness and, in, and inattentiveness, um, the evidence is is not as is not particularly clear cut. Um, you know, there there may be a potential; it may not exist. It's kind of one of those areas of the research where there is a huge gap, um, kind of like we've been talking about with a number of the other conditions. And you know, there definitely needs to be more research into its effect on those core symptoms of ADHD. A lot of the evidence around ADHD has kind of been applied from other psychiatric conditions. So its effects on anxiety have kind of, and we know that, um, you know, ADHD in and of itself can cause some symptoms of anxiety, but also a number of people uh, with ADHD have, you know, comorbid anxiety disorder. If their anxiety is significant enough to cause them distress on a day-to-day -day basis. And, that is where there is a higher level of evidence and in which you know it is being more commonly prescribed for those reasons rather than um, those core symptoms of ADHD. Although, as I mentioned, that kind of preclinical evidence maybe suggests that that is something we want to look at further in, in future research for sure. Um, it's just that the evidence isn't quite there yet to suggest whether it is positive, neutral or, or, or negative on that at the moment. Do you find that a lot of people that can use cannabis to treat their ADHD, when I mean treat, I mean just the symptoms like anxiety or depression that kind of go with ADHD, that they're able to manage ADHD more effectively on their own when some of those are nulled down a little bit? Like, I don't, I don't not recommend ADHD medication like Adderall and things of that sort. I think it, if it works for somebody, it works for somebody. But obviously, there's a kind of like it's one of those controversial subjects, just a lot of people that don't like taking it. I'm one of those people. So then I'm like, let's look at other things as well, too. But I also don't like taking cannabis because I've had bad effects every time. But I'm wondering if we can't focus on like, I'm sure I'm, the cannabis can't treat the hyperactivity, even though it seems like they would wind down a little bit. I don't know if there's evidence to support that it treats the hyperactivity. But if it's just treating the anxiety parts, which is a big problem with it, and then also some other factors like depression, I feel like then it becomes more manageable for the person to maybe it doesn't treat the whole ADHD, but it, then now you can at least handle like, okay, well, I just got the energy aspect and I need to do the focus part, but the rest of it, all the pain and all the, I don't want to leave my house because I'm so, that that is treated. So now you can still function at least. No, I think, and that's kind of the rationale for the, the treatment of most mental health conditions, really. Um, it's not, um, in many cases, what you're trying to do is both use 
psychological therapies, social support, medications to kind of unpick negative cycles. So, you know, we know if, and, you know, people with mental health conditions will, you know, will, will really understand this, you know, sometimes you just kind of see, kind of end up in this negative spiral and um, often the way back out is kind of putting things back into your life. So, um, you know, if you have really bad anxiety, you may find it difficult to then like clean your house and then therefore you stop inviting people over, you stop seeing people, you have more anxiety, you you stop, you know, and, and this kind of, you're, you're completely right, whereby, um, you know, trying to treat one aspect or something like that may be able to have um, other impacts elsewhere. And this is something we haven't been able to do with our ADHD research yet, just because the numbers aren't quite big enough. But when we've tried to look at it within our chronic pain population, whereby we we just have more people who are being prescribed chronic pain, so we're more able to do this kind of research. So we took individuals with chronic pain and um, generalized anxiety disorder and compared them their outcomes to those people with chronic pain and, and didn't have generalized anxiety disorder. And kind of our hypothesis was that maybe those people with generalized anxiety disorder would have even more benefits because, you know, we're treating that that portion of, of their life in addition to the chronic pain. Um, what we saw didn't exactly um, fit entirely with that hypothesis, but we did see some signals towards those people with chronic pain and generalized anxiety disorder having um, maybe... Uh, a slight improvement in their chronic pain severity compared to those without um, generalized anxiety disorder. But the main difference between the two was the in their general health related quality of life. So that's a measure encompassing, um, you know, um, their mobility and their able to, ability to carry out their usual activities and and their anxiety and depression and their pain. And stuff. But that, that's actually where uh, the large amount of benefits came. Um, so in summary, we don't really have that data for uh, ADHD. When we've tried to look at it in other conditions, there's some signals towards that maybe being the case, um, but it's, it's not conclusive at the moment. Um, you know, I wouldn't bet my house on it. Um, and, um, but, you know, um, it certainly fits the pattern of, of treating um, any condition that has a psychological component, not not even those traditionally thought as mental health conditions. So, um, you know, it, it may well um, have a really, uh, you know, a meaningful impact on those core symptoms of ADHD. But, but as of yet, um, it's still kind of unproven. Is it common to have something like that where there's not, it's not proven yet or there's not enough evidence to support it when it comes to mood disorders? I mean, marijuana has always been used like called like the happy drug. Whenever you see it in a movie, it's got like a happy face sticker posted on the bag or something like that. But I feel like especially with something with ADHD, there is a fluctuation in emotions depending on the day, which I feel like you, you could probably use it if you're going to use it medically. You could probably use it for, you know, I don't want to take it today, but I'll take it tomorrow. It's something like that. Where something different with Adderall, you got to take that like every day. I've heard some people say you can take it a little bit here and then stop. But from what I've been recommended, it's not good to just, you know, stop it. I mean, it's not going to have any damage to you, but you want to keep taking it because it does work. So with cannabis, it's one of these where I think it would, it would appeal to a lot of people, not just because there's not a whole lot of stigma behind it anymore, but it's just the factor of that they can just choose not to get high one day or choose not to take a product or take their medicine, whatever you want to say that day, because they're just, they're already in a good mood. So it's not going to ruin their day or put them on a medicated thing. And then the next day, if they feel like they want to medicate with it, they can, but is it the emotional aspect to it? Does that make it hard to diagnose if the evidence is going to work for some of these types of drugs? Yeah, I think that was a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Um, it's always it's always difficult to test if something works if you're reliant on like subjective me measures. And so, if you take, for instance, like high blood pressure, you can take someone's blood pressure. It may fluctuate day to day within the day. Well, I mean, it definitely does. It definitely does fluctuate day to day within the day. But largely, the trend is it kind of stays around the same as long as you're not giving anyone any blood pressure medications. And the other thing is you have a really objective measure. You 
measure it in their arm, their leg, whatever you may do, you have a number. Um, and that number, you know, is quite fixed. Whereas if you want to um, look at anxiety, ADHD, um, even, you know, chronic pain, things for which you have no biological marker, you are reliant on people answering a survey and you can't give people a survey every hour of every day. You can't, you can't give it, give it to them re realistically, probably more than once a week and how you're fluctuating and how you're feeling on a day to day basis, we know can, can massively change. And so it is always just generally more difficult to, um, to find the answers, um, in those kind, kind of settings. Um, but obviously people have, have done it. Otherwise we would have no medications on no treatments for, for any mental health condition. So it is, it is definitely possible, but, but you're right. It, it's, it's more challenging than, than if you have something that has like a really objective marker, like high blood pressure or diabetes, where you're looking at blood sugar levels, for example. Now, what causes someone who has maybe ADHD or maybe some other type of mood disorder or psychiatric disorder that would cause them to have an adverse effect to the, what I've only been able to find is bipolar. Um, like I said, I just found a subreddit where a bunch of people were talking about that they had this, they would ask a question like, anybody else had this adverse effect after, you know, taking cannabis or doing something with cannabis? And I, I, I had it and it seemed like a lot of people, whenever I would bring it up, they would look at me like I was against its legalization. I was like, no, that's not it. I was just, I, I wanted to know if there was evidence to support, you know, if there was any psychosis or what would even cause someone or high propensity to have a psychosis from marijuana. I, I don't think it's just exactly taking too much. It seems like even with very little, I'll still get a really bad interaction with it. Yeah, I think, um, so there's, there's a number of things. The, the first thing that you could do as a doctor to reduce the risk of adverse events is, is something that we all, that we always use in at Sapphire clinics is that we start people off on a low dose. And then we are at a, at a level whereby we would be confident that for most people, it wouldn't cause any adverse events unless you were, you know, quite sensitive. And then we slowly titrate that up over time such that, um, you know, hopefully the goal is, it, obviously this isn't the same for everyone, but the goal is, is to increase them to a point whereby the medical cannabis is having its maximum beneficial effects, but without having... Um, any drawbacks so that that's that's kind of the goal and and obviously for some people they get adverse events before they start to experience any any positive effects some people never experience any positive effects but you know that's that's kind of the goal that we're we're working towards so that's that's one way you can definitely reduce the risk of adverse events is if you start off off on a low dose whereby most people won't experience um, adverse events and you increase it slowly um you know you build up tolerance to those to those effects so of cannabis um and, and reduce reduce that risk another thing is is in terms of like the choice of individuals there are some people whereby you clearly wouldn't want to either take cannabis if you're initiating yourself or as a doctor prescribing it if someone has schizophrenia or has um previously demonstrated drug-induced psychosis or um or anything of that nature, obviously this would, these would be individuals whereby you already know that they're at high risk of developing psychosis and thereby um, initiating cannabis probably isn't a good idea. The third group of individuals are is where it becomes a bit more challenging. So these are people who have um, psychiatric conditions such as PTSD, for example, such as depression, whereby the vast majority of people don't have psychotic symptoms, but if you do have very severe forms of that condition, you may end up having psychotic symptoms. And therefore, if you're, you may already be slightly predispositioned to, to experiencing psychosis anyway, as a result of those conditions. So, um, and then sort of the next sort of one is one that is impossible to tell is that you just have some genetic predisposition. There's something either with, um, your body, how you metabolize cannabis or with your brain or whatever it may be, there's just something about your biology that just does not work with cannabis and makes you at risk of, of having, um, you know, delusions or hallucinations or, or whatever it may be. 
And that's something that's really difficult to be able to know up front. Um, I'd have to think that'd be severely rare because you never hear anything, like I said, about a certain genetic disposal to, you know, because uh, cannabis is always taught as like a healthy or happy drug or something that was good for you. Um, and I've seen little, like I said, little adverse effects. So I've seen some papers published, but if it's a genetic thing, then what compound in cannabis would be causing some type of reaction that would have you do that? It can't just be because I could smoke other like I could smoke nicotine and I'm fine. It gives me a stimulant, but I, not with cannabis or anything. Maybe in the U.S. it's different because you could smoke it. I didn't know it was illegal in the U.K. to do that. No, no, no. So um, so it would be a reaction to the, t- the THC, but it's 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 a genetic thing within you. So whether how your cannabinoid receptors are expressed in your brain or something to do with how you metabolize THC, you end up with more active compounds, you know, flowing through your body. You know, we're not sure, but there definitely are. That would be the the main reason to be able to explain why some people um do have you know um drug induced psychosis caused by cannabis and other people do not and you would be able to give you know those two individuals exactly the same amount of cannabis and one person would have a negative effect and one person wouldn't and you can you can largely extrapolate that to all adverse events from from all drugs um you know some and also the positive effects you know, um, the same medication that may be beneficial for me may not be beneficial for you. One may cause me adverse events, may not. You. And um, realistically, and maybe maybe it's better just referring to it rather rather than like genetic susceptibility, just like biological differences between humans. That um, not everyone reacts to the same medication, drug, substance, whatever way in which you are using cannabis. Um, the same way and there are just fundamental biological differences that mean that some people if they consume cannabis um regularly at a high enough dose they will unfortunately um experience psychosis you mentioned ptsd and kind of trauma that goes with ptsd that causes or the trauma that causes for ptsd but is that because that like cannabis or that can affect memory and that can trigger some mechanism in the brain that can bring back some maybe horrible memories that someone might have that's causing them to have ptsd because one thing with um adhd there's a large amount of trauma that comes with adhd so it's kind of two questions right there but i'm just trying to make that connection with my brain there yeah, no, I, I don't. Um, it, it's uh, some. It is a it is a reported adverse event in, with regards to some people do experience some um, sort of memory impairment. Not to the extent you know that you have amnesia. Just maybe you find it difficult yeah. recording things um, acutely, and then that wears off. Um, but um, that seems to happen in a quite small uh, population when we look at it at large. And I think um, drilling down into it, I think the, the two core mechanisms by which um, you know cannabis has been investigated with respect to PTSD is that kind of uh, high anxiety state that people with PTSD find themselves in, um, but also in terms of the effects of um, cannabis on sleep. So a number of people with PTSD um have poor sleep um whether that be just generally they have insomnia or lots of people experience night terrors or night waking due to flashbacks um and so again kind of like as we were talking about before with kind of can you interrupt that cycle of mental health conditions if you can maybe improve the sleep of someone with ptsd they, maybe that has a knock-on effect for the rest of best of their um, outcomes if you can maybe interrupt the anxiety portion of their PTSD maybe if you could do both then even better so so those are the like the two mechanisms by which um you know a lot of the the research around medical cannabis and, and PTSD um, has been done when it comes to the sample that you used for ADHD I mean is it common over there like is it diagnostic are people open about speaking and want to be a part of an ADHD test like I don't know how prevalent 
ADHD is in the UK. Over here, it seemed like I wasn't really noticing it until I started talking about it. A bunch of people coming forward saying they have ADHD or something of that sort. So I'm wondering for your sample, for your study, did you have a lot of people that were open to want to be you know involved if there's there's still stigma behind having ADHD and how many people did you test? Yeah, so um, so stigma around ADHD is is definitely improving. Um, and actually, the interesting thing when you look at ADHD populations, at, although it's something that we maybe consider um, to be more prevalent in the Western world. Um, if you look at specifically at ADHD symptoms, they generally track right across the world. Um, and it may be that the that the instance rate that we see in North America, Europe, uh, Australasia, et cetera, may be largely due to the fact of in, increased awareness, increased education, um, and diagnosis rates, you know, um, whereas it may be more difficult to, to get that elsewhere. But we see that largely the symptom rate is kind of the same across the world and specific, and within Western European and North American nations, the incidence rate is largely similar. So it's around about 5% in children, 2.5% in adults. Um, it's kind of rising all the time in adults as more people um, generally sort of become aware. And it it's kind of thought that um, definitely people, for the vast majority of people, their symptoms of ADHD will improve sort of post-adolescence, even if the ADHD generally does stick around. It generally sort of peaks in adolescence, young adulthood, and then um, improves in later life. But it's generally thought that that for most people, they, they experience some degree of ADHD, um, if not lifelong, definitely sort of into middle age and, and beyond. So it's thought that probably the the actual diagnosis rate is is probably you know closer to five percent in adults as well. It's just it hasn't been picked up in them when they were children, um, and they've kind of um, masking to too. Not. Usually, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, sorry, I completely forgot the next part of your question. I kind of got um, oh about um, were people willing to come forward for the study? So, so I, I think. Kind of in the in the way in which we recruit for the study, it's actually in people who have already um, we're studying people who have already accessed medical cannabis for uh, for whatever condition they're being treated for. So um, we actually cap we capture them right at that beginning stage and then follow them through. So um, so yeah, so actually it's absolutely we don't find that there's any problems at all um, with that. Were you surprised at the number of people that you could find that were using cannabis for ADHD? Um, it was it's still relatively small numbers. So in the UK, it's estimated as like thirty thousand or so people being prescribed medical cannabis generally, like across the UK. Across the UK, um, and so we weren't necessarily surprised by by the numbers, but I think it's it's because. There's not that many people being prescribed medical cannabis more generally in the UK um, compared to other countries. So, um, so it didn't really surprise us from that point of view. Now, you mentioned chronic pain. Is that the one with the most impact that medical cannabis is used for? Or which one has the most, I wouldn't say evidence like to show that it treats this person better. Or what's the one that gets, well, you mentioned largely prescribed for would be chronic pain. But which one has, I guess, the most evidence to support that it actually does do a very big impact? Like I, I mentioned before about a serious disorder, which I would consider schizophrenia. I mean, is there anything of that magnitude where really th their disorder impairs their life so much, but then medical cannabis has shown to really reduce something that is very, very serious on that scale? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the key one are those kind of license treatments that I talked about. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I'll start again. I think the key key things are those license treatments that we talked about at the beginning. So. Um, so for treatment resistant epilepsy in children, uh, Epidiolex, which is like a CBD isolate that has sort of the clearest evidence around its its effectiveness, and then sort of Sativex um, in um, multiple sclerosis associated spasticity, as well as Nabilone for chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. Those those are like the, the three um, conditions where whereby we definitely have the sort of greatest evidence uh, around it around its effects for sure. 
How common are those? Um, so, um, well, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting is probably the most common, but actually in terms of like the relative prescribing of nabilone for those, for that indication, because we have such a high number of um, anti-sickness medications already on the market, we don't see it really that commonly prescribed. Um, multiple sclerosis is, um, you know, it, it's thankfully not super common, but, you know, it's common enough that, that you see it quite commonly if you are a primary care physician or a, a GP, you, you know, you definitely have um, uh, quite a few patients that, that see you for multiple sclerosis. And, and you know, that, that probably is the most common um, reason why one of those licensed medications are prescribed is, is for spasticity associated with MS. And then the the treatment resistant epilepsy disorders, they are like actually really quite rare, um, thankfully, because um, the 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 way in which the licensing has been done it is rather than saying for epilepsy in general, they have to be for specific epilepsy syndromes. So it's only three different epilepsy syndromes in which it's been sort of evaluated and, and treated. And when you look at it, at it on that really small syndrome basis, it's it's sort of, you know, l l tens to low hundreds of, of children that it may affect in the UK rather than when we're talking about multiple sclerosis, it's like hundreds of thousands. Still a lot. Yeah, yeah. Now, does that treatment for epilepsy, does that, will that be able to, like, as they get older and maybe early kind of usage on that, will that help? I mean, some people, like, I have a friend that has epilepsy and they can't drive. So I'm wondering if it's going to help still be able to fulfill some things of being an adult as well, too. Like, will these will potentially be able to be something that could be used for, get to a point where it could help somebody, you know, still drive their car, even though they have epilepsy? Yeah, so I think um, in the UK, um, so if you were to take uh, Epidiolex at licensed treatment, it's just CBD. So um, there is no risk of cognitive impairment with that. So, so I wouldn't be necessarily concerned with that. But even with medical cannabis, with that way in which we introduce it um, at a low dose and increase it slowly so that we reduce any risk, well, reduce the risk of adverse events as much as possible. Um, in the UK, the guidance is that you do not have to inform uh, the DVLA, who are, who are the people who sort of um, go up, they're the DVA uh, equivalent in the UK. And um, so you don't have to inform them that you are a medical cannabis patient, um, but you do have to inform them if you have a condition which um, may impair your driving. And so the only condition that we see um, and we prescribe medical cannabis for routinely that, that sort of encounters that is epilepsy, as, as you mentioned. Um, and there's just like really clear guidance around, um, around, you know, when you had your last um, seizure and then when you'd be next allowed to drive. So it wouldn't really matter what medication you're prescribed. It's all to do around when was the last seizure that you had um, and you know when you when you when you may be able to to drive. That's that's kind of the only limitation. I think the real challenging thing for people who do have epilepsy is when they're kind of in that situation where things are quite stable, um, and then they'll go and see either, either their GP or their neurologist, and there's a discussion around sort of tapering down their medications um, because obviously people want to try and get people off medications as much as possible. Um, you know, it's a you know, I've definitely had conversations with people who have epilepsy in the past, whereby they're really reluctant to do that because obviously, if you were to take it when they do experience a seizure, even if you increase their medication again, they're still going to be barred from driving for up to a year. So, um, so so yeah, I think there, you know, um, in the UK, we're quite lucky in that we have like sort of really quite clear guidance around um, medications and and what you have to then declare and then also the conditions of what you have to declare where it becomes slightly different is if you're if you like drive a heavy goods lorry or a pilot or something like that then um definitely for pilots they're not allowed to be prescribed medical cannabis but that kind of extends to opioids and all other sorts of medications they're not allowed to be on um, whilst they're a pilot and then for heavy goods vehicles drivers we um we tend to recommend that they sort of move into another driving profession if they want to 
to to continue accessing medical cannabis because some people so there has been some reports of a couple of people being able to still maintain their license whilst being prescribed medical cannabis um but it's, but um in that area it seems to be much more blurred lines and so i think the the general guidance that we give to patients anyway is that we we wouldn't prescribe to you if you if you drive one of those these big big lorries that um or anything along those lines how much of your industry is affected by the where the capacity for technology is right now like do you see this changing in the next five years on the basis of technology or what do you what do you think like in the next five years what would be something that you would need an improvement on to see some real big change happen technology just more research studies being out there the more i guess stigma being taken out of some of it as well too more people diagnosis yeah i think um the medical cannabis industry in the uk is is one that um and its relationship with technology is quite interesting so um the 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 rescheduling came at the end of 2018, but Sapphire was the first clinic to start seeing people um, at the end of 2019. And then um, we are all very familiar with what happened in 2020 um, with regards to the COVID pandemic. And so, you know, initially we were set up to see patients in physical settings around the UK. Um, and that's that was going to be what we were going to do and then march and april happened and that very much wasn't going to be the case and so um just like every other aspect of healthcare we very much moved to a virtual model um and actually it works really well um it means that we're able to see people right from right across the country they don't have to come to big metropolitan hubs um and therefore um you know that that's a real benefit to to patients but also um, in terms of our, visit, our our doctors. So part of the regulations around prescribing is that you have to do it in what's called a multidisciplinary team. So it has to be a group of doctors from all different specialties who make the final decision on whether someone is eligible um, and indeed suitable for medical cannabis. And um, by having a remote um, first model, actually that allows us to have doctors from all different parts of the country come together and make those decisions rather than visit, having to have six people from London, six people from Manchester or wherever it may be. Um, it becomes, you know, it would have, it would have become much more challenging, much quicker um, for us from that point of view to see the number of patients that, that, that we do see. Um, so that's one thing where we've adopted and, and that tends to be ten most clinics across the board have have adopted that model um, and it seems to work really well. The challenge we have, so another, this is kind of like a, another legislative challenge is that um, prescriptions for medical cannabis cannot be made as electronic prescriptions. They have to be physically written down on a paper pad and sent to the pharmacy. And that pharmacy must be called what's called like a specials pharmacy. So they are specific pharmacies with the designation to um to prescribe unlicensed i'm sorry to dispense unlicensed medical cannabis products so um there are only like a handful of them across the uk compared to like your general farm pharmacist or drugstore that you would see you know multiple of in any town city center um so when you have that as like a limiting factor um that's one thing that 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 technology would be fantastic at trying to get around. But unfortunately, there's only so much that if the legislation is, it has to be on a paper pad and it has to be delivered um, to a physical location. You know, that's something whereby um, there definitely already is a technological uh, plan in place. You know, If I go to any other doctor, it would just be done uh, electronically. But unfortunately, because of the legislation, around medical cannabis, you then can't can't do that. So that's that, you know, that's something whereby um whereby we would be able to adopt technology really quickly. Um but but we're kind of have a high our hands tied in that respect. I'm guessing that legislation thing is a clearly political issue with um the legalization of using medical marijuana. Um yeah I, th I think well it I don't know the politics there, but over here that was our problem for the longest time. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's one of those things that um, 
it doesn't just extend to medical cannabis. It's kind of all um, unlicensed controlled medicines. So um, I think it's just quite an antiquated bit of rules and regulation that no one has really thought to look at because um, it's affecting such a small part of the population. I mean, if this was affecting how really caught like how insulin is being prescribed someone would would sort it out tomorrow um but because it's affecting like a really small part of the population and you know maybe that maybe that is a stigma thing maybe it is uh, or maybe it's just a, a time issue or or whatever it may be um it, it 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 currently is is what it is so we kind of have to to make do um but it's you know it's frustrating as as a, as a doctor but also it's frustrating if you're a patient because you have to be just like super hyper organized in terms of making sure that you put in your repeat prescription really early so that you allow all of that time for it to be written physically sent off then then it to be couriered from that specialist pharmacy to your address all of those things just take time um whereas if it could just be done online then you know um, it could be done in seconds within a day easily. Yeah. Uh, with um down here at the dispensary, they only take cash because it's still illegal at the federal level. So your some banks won't like if you use a bank card, they won't let you do any transactions that way. Which I just thought was weird. I was like, I guess yeah, it's legal in the state, but then on the federal level, that means you have to pull money out of an ATM, take the cash to the dispensary to pay for it there to get your prescription or whatever someone's using. Which I just feel like that's an extra hassle, and a lot of people that already don't like going out into public are already not very task oriented in a lot of their processes, especially with ADHD. That's like a it's like asking someone to walk a hundred miles. Like for me, at least it's like, they have to do all these different things and still remember at that point, people just give up. They're just like, nah, no, it's not that important to me then. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, it was only just a couple of days ago whereby the sort of federal banking bill, um, was sort of pushed through in the Senate. <clears throat> so it'd be interesting to see how that, does, how that does affect things. I think the general feeling is it, it is largely going to be positive in terms of, um, sort of moving away from that cash only model, but um, nobody carries cash anymore. That's the problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Simon, I appreciate the time you gave me to talk on my show. Is there a place where people can find any of your links if you want to promote your uh pro profile on your university site or the uh, Sapphire site, and also if you want to put your Twitter in there as well too, or any other social links that you might have? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, you can find most of my stuff at sapphireclinics.com um and then i also work um at imperial college london that's my university affiliation so if you um just google my name and imperial college london um i'm the only person who works there with my name so yeah, that'll come up uh, and then yeah you can find me on 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 twitter at simon underscore erridge but um if anyone wants to reach out and talk more I'd be happy to to do so and I'm going to link all those links in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.